Hello, this is Brother Denny. Welcome to Charity Ministries. Our desire is that your life would be blessed and changed by this message. This message is not copyrighted and is not to be bought or sold. You are welcome to make copies for your friends and neighbors. If you would like additional messages, please go to our website for a complete listing at www.charityministries.org. If you would like a catalog of other sermons, please call 1-800-227-7902 or write to Charity Ministries, 400 West Main Street, Suite 1, Ephra, PA, 17522. These messages are offered to all without charge by the free will offerings of God's people. A special thank you to all who support this ministry. Yes, our Father, our God. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Thank you, Lord, for the song of the souls that have been set free. Thank you for the sweet sound of the songs, Father. Lord, we plead with you again today that you would come and visit us, meet with us. Yes, Lord, let the things that I say be a sweet sound in your ear. Sit here among us, Lord, and watch over this service. Rebuke thou Satan away from us, Lord, in Jesus' name, and all of his evil spirits, God. Rebuke them all away from us in Jesus' name. Cleanse this atmosphere, this meeting with the blood of Jesus Christ, God. And fill us with the Holy Ghost. We need you, Lord. We can't do it without none of us in this room. So we trust you and we thank you for hearing us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I was thinking, as the report was given to me of what was happening last evening, and of course these things are coming all week long, but it's always a joy to me to see, you know, you, you all, you come together, you, you know, Saturday, Sunday, we start meeting on Monday, you open your hearts to the Lord, God continues to work in your lives, you clean up, you clear up, you pray up, and you, as that, all of that happens, you begin to unite your hearts together, you pray God begins to work and answer your prayers and souls get converted one after another after another. That's what I'm talking about all week long, young people. <laughs> See, that's what happens. That is the church of Jesus Christ, young people. Coming together, clear, right with God, in love with God, completely dedicated to God, uniting their hearts together, believing in God, and praying to God that He will work in other people's lives. And what you have seen happen here this week, that is exactly the way it's supposed to be in every church. And you get to be a part of it. That's exciting to me. Well, that just fits in with some of what I want to say here today. This is the last message of the session on revival. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 3. The title of the message today is Continuous Revival, the New Testament Standard. Continuous Revival. The New Testament standard. Reading from Hebrews chapter 3, Brother Rick has already admonished you out of these verses, but I want to use them again because they're one of the clearest expressions of God's heart 
and the standard of the New Testament that we are to continue in this beautiful grace which God is wrought in our hearts. <clears throat> so Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6 says, But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Now, that's, those words express to me a vibrant faith. Those words express to me uh, what you have been experiencing this week and what you are experiencing today. You have a confidence in you. There is a rejoicing in you. You have a lively hope in you. And welcome home. That's what Christianity is supposed to be. But God now says to us, Whose house are we if we hold fast this rejoicing, this confidence, this lively hope, this zeal, this joy, all the way to the end. You understand, young people? And so he goes on to say in verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Departing from the living God. You say, departing from the living God? Yes. By the way, young people, if you go out of here and you go back to your homes and you go your own way, you will be living out an evil heart of unbelief, departing from the beautiful presence of God that you know in this place. Take heed, young people! But, instead, exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And you've heard plenty about that this week. Why does he say such words? For or because. Because we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Do you understand that standard, young people? This is a lifelong Christianity. This is not some high time that you have at Bible school and then you just go your own way and live your own life. No, this thing just keeps going on and on and on. I mean, it's 30 years for me and I'm still running. And I'm still excited. That's the way it's supposed to be. Continuous revival, the New Testament standard. One of the clearest tests of true revival is whether it continues. By the way, that is the clearest test of true conversion also. Does it continue? The test of God's work in your heart this week will be seen in the weeks to come. Will it wither in the sun and die? Will it be choked out by other more important things in the days to come? Or will it bear fruit some thirty, some sixty, some hundredfold? That is the test of what God has been doing in your heart this week. There was a beautiful move of God's Spirit on the east side of Africa back in 1930s. That's in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. This was an African revival, young people. It was brought on by the Africans' response to their own deadness. They somehow had enough insight and wisdom to begin to acknowledge where they were really at with God. It wasn't brought on by missionaries like I told you maybe yesterday or sometime this week about the German missionaries and the Zulus. No, this was an area of eastern Africa that had been uh, well evangelized by missionaries and there were churches all over the place. But these then, these indigenous African churches had cooled down. They lost their first love. They recognized... They saw that they had left their first love. Church was more of a ritual than real. 
There was little love one for another and there was almost no conversions. And when there's almost no conversions, it's time to get serious. A church. <clears throat> By their own initiative, they started getting desperate with God in the ways that I have been describing to you through this week. God began to visit their congregations. More people joined in prayer. And soon, revival broke out everywhere. Just like I've described to you with many, many examples this week. It was called the East African Revival. One of the most unusual aspects of this revival was it lasted for over 30 years. It continued, and therefore it was real. It stood the test of very hard times. During Kenya's fight for independence, the Christians would not take sides, but chose to be neutral. This brought persecution from both sides. Many of the Christians during the independence of Kenya, they were brutally tortured and killed. But the revival fires continued to burn. It's almost, you know, as I look at it from heaven's perspective, that God looked down and knew that a great purging and a great trial was going to come upon the church of Jesus Christ in Kenya. And He began to stir in the hearts of those that were there. And they were awakened to their need to, for their lack of reality. And they began to pray. And God visited them. And God strengthened them. And then brought them through a very, very difficult time. But the East African revival, which continued for over 30 years, it stood the test of time. The longevity of this revival drew the attention of many from Britain and America. And they actually sent delegations to investigate if this was real and to investigate why it continued year after glorious year. These delegations found out that the East African revival was indeed very genuine, and they began to sit at the feet of their African brothers and ask questions. I like that. <laughs> the African indigenous church is teaching us a few things, and that's the way it ought to be, by the way. That's the way it ought to be. Two men came back from their visits totally changed. I'm sure many more than that did, but these two men, they came back totally changed, deeply burdened for the Western church and its lack of reality. They each wrote a book about the secrets of this continual revival in East Africa. Their names, Roy Hessian and Norman Grubb. Roy Hessian wrote the book, The Calvary Road. Norman Grubb wrote the book, Continuous Revival. They're both back there on the table. Both of these men wrote books about the aspects of that revival which they felt was causing it to continue and continue and continue. And those books became famous in the Christian world and read by many my burden for this last message is to challenge you and give you some practical instruction for everyday life. You know what I'm saying? We can't stay here. I mean, this would be great, you know. Let's just build three tabernacles and stay. But reality is that God is a living God for real people who live in a real world. And what God is doing in our hearts this week must work in a real world or it's not real. Amen? It's not real. So I want to give you some practical instruction. We must continue. <clears throat> I could have given this sermon, by the way, any time during the week. It would have fit in anywhere. However, I wanted to wait until the end of the week on purpose. Because I knew that by then, many of you would be clear, 
free, revived, and living under an open heaven. How many of you could say, yes, Brother Denny, I'm clear and clean and revived and I'm living under an open heaven? Wonderful. Well, I knew it would be that way by now. And therefore, I felt it's... You will learn more of what I want to tell you now than you would have if I would have given it to you on Tuesday. <clears throat> so, where do we go from here? <clears throat> Well, young people, it's time for you to learn to walk with God. That's why God has brought you here to this Bible school. Yes, He has instructed you with many, many things, but I'm telling you the bottom line heart of God for bringing you to this Bible school is that you might learn to walk with Him. When you learn to walk with Him, you will not need another Bible school to get you all straightened out again. Now, it's okay to come. Whether you don't need to be straightened out, it doesn't matter, but you will not need the Bible school. And honestly... Many of you came needing the Bible school, didn't you? So, where do we go from here? I want to share a few practical points with you today on continuous revival. These points are those very aspects of the revival in Eastern Africa that those men and many other men noted. This is why this thing keeps on moving. First of all, we need to be walking in total and continual surrender. I'm sure you understand a little bit about what that is all about by now. Because you have been learning to do that through these days, through these sessions. Question. How many of you had to clear your conscience about something today? Let me see your hand. Good. Walking in total and continual surrender is one of the keys to continuous revival. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 clearly brings this out. We will not be able to go anywhere with God if we do not come to that place where our heart says, all to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. And our heart says that, not at the Bible school, not at the end of a hot message, but every single day and yea, throughout the day. I beseech you therefore, young people, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This is what God is after in your life. Very few young people grasp the depths of what it means to yield themselves completely to God and to walk that way. To be yielded to God means I've given up myself. To be yielded to God means I've given up my plans. To be yielded to God means I've given up my future. And it doesn't matter to me what happens to me. Whatever God wants me to do, I'll do. To be yielded to God means I've given up my boyfriend or my girlfriend. Yes, yielding yourself to God means things like that. I'm sure that you would agree with me that if we're going to learn to walk with God, it's absolute absurd thought to think that we could learn to walk with God if we're not going to yield. If we're not going to yield, we're not going to get anywhere. And see, young people, the test is on. I mean, the test is on. I and mean, you're here and you're shouting, Amen, Hallelujah, and praise God for that. And you're back there in those prayer rooms and you're praying and that's beautiful. But I'm telling you, the test is on. Next week, the test is on. If you're holding on to something, if you have a private reservation in your heart, if you're already planning to do some things that you know God would have you to give them up, the test is on. It's on. 
You will never learn to walk with God. You'll never know what continuous revival is. You'll never know what, what, uh, what streams of living water are. You'll never know what a fountain of living water bubbling up and flowing out of you is. You'll never know what it is until you come to that place where your heart says, I give up. You know, some time ago in my morning time, quiet time, God was dealing with me about a certain thing in my life and I was wrestling a bit with it and God was wrestling with me and I was wrestling with God. Yeah, I do that too. You know, the Lord spoke to me in the midst of those wrestlings as I was praying and meditating and pondering and you know how we are. We try to reason this thing away and it's not that, it's this and... And you know, finally, the Lord spoke these words to my heart out of the life of the Lord Jesus when He was there on the cross. The Bible says, He said these words, It is finished. And then it says, He bowed His head and gave up the ghost and died. And God said, Denny, Why don't you just bow your head and give up the ghost and die? Now, God wasn't telling me to drop over dead. God was telling me to give up my will. Because, by the way, that was the greatest act of surrender that Jesus made right there. He bowed His head and gave up the ghost and died. And tasted death for every man, didn't he? Number two, walking with a clear conscience. You've heard some about that this week, but I just want to put them in order for you here this afternoon. Walking with a clear conscience. The Apostle Paul described his life in this way in Acts chapter 24 and verse 16. Imagine giving such a testimony, describing what your life is like. He said, Herein do I exercise myself. I am exercising. I exercise myself to have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. That's my exercise, Paul said. What was Paul saying? I've learned that I cannot walk with God if I do not keep my conscience clear. Have you learned that this week? Hmm? Last night, while I was in the service, I was sitting here, beautiful meeting, singing, beautiful worship, oh, heaven, open, everything beautiful. But in the middle of the service, something was going on that caught my eye and troubled me. And it was a right trouble. It was a right concern that I had. But as I sat in the meeting and let this thing trouble me and trouble me, pretty soon I started stewing about it. And by the end of the meeting, I had a critical attitude about that which was happening. And guess what? You can't have a critical attitude and walk with God. So I had to get it right. I had to make it right. You know, God said, you know, Denny, you've got a critical attitude. Boy, that's not right. You may have seen something. You may have a right concern, but you've got a rotten attitude about it now, boy. You need to make it right. And so I made it right. Why? I want to walk with God. That's why. I want to walk with God. It's not all there is to walking with God, but if you don't get this matter of walking with a clear conscience, it won't go well for you. And probably the rest of what I'm going to say won't make much sense to you. You must be willing to keep your conscience clear. That's something that you can do. You can do it any time. You've been doing it this week. You know how easy it is. Just go get on your knees somewhere or go get alone by yourself and say, Lord, forgive me. I'm wrong. These thoughts I'm having are wrong. That look I took was wrong. Those words I said, they were wrong. I repent. Forgive me. Wash me.
That's how it works, young people. I was thinking about the other day, I wonder what Bible school would be like if we had it for six weeks. I'm not sure if the teacher's going to handle it and all the principles. But you know what? I think you'd learn to walk with God in six weeks. I think you would. It would be such a pattern and a habit in your life in six weeks' time. But dear young people, you don't have to come to the greenhouse in order to learn to walk with God. You just need to have a yielded heart so that when things aren't right, yeah, that surrendered heart will say, Yes, Lord, yes. You see? Number three, walking in humility and brokenness. That was one of the things that they noticed. Walking in humility and brokenness. This was one of the key verses in the East African Revival, Isaiah 57 and verse 15. You know that verse? The Bible says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. <clears throat> Isaiah said in verse 15 of chapter 57, Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. That's that God we learned about on Monday night, remember? Remember His being shone like amber? Remember? That's the high and lofty one whose name is holy. Now what does He say? I dwell in the high and holy place. I am God. And I dwell in the high and holy place. I am so big, I inhabit eternity. If you want to find a place to fit me, I fit into eternity, says God. I reach all the way into eternity past and pass through eternity present and reach all the way to eternity future. That's how big I am. And I dwell in the high and holy place. But there's another place where God chooses to dwell. With Him also, that is of a contrite and a humble spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. Look at that verse, young people. Here's where the graces of humility that are mentioned there in, in uh, Matthew chapter 5 of the Sermon on the Mount. You know, they call them the, the Beatitudes. I call them the graces of humility. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness. This kind of a posture is a posture which invites the presence of God to draw near to our lives. And He will come continually reviving, quickening your heart in your life. You know, it's very interesting to me as I was studying the word revival in the Hebrew, I discovered that in Psalm 119, the word comes up about ten times in Psalm 119. You know Psalm 119? Only it doesn't use, it's not translated revive, but it's the same Hebrew word as this one right here. But in Psalm 119, it's the word quicken. Quicken. But over and over, the psalmist says, Quicken me according to your word. Oh, what a beautiful prayer. Revive me into the reality of your word, O oh Lord, again today. How do you do that? You come with a broken heart before God and say, God, I'm not going to make it. Quicken me according to your word. Walking in humility and brokenness, young people. This is, these are some of the secrets that those men learned when they went to the East Africans and sat in their meetings and watched and beheld and, yea, entered in and found themselves flat on their face in a prayer room, weeping their heart out over their needs. God resisteth the proud 
And He gives grace to the humble. And that applies 20 times a day if need be. God resists the proud. And He gives grace unto the humble. I'm sure you know that by now. But I'm here just putting it all in an order here at the end of the Bible school for you. Number four. Walking with God in the morning. Walking with God in the morning. We should read over in Psalm 63 for that. Do you know those verses in Psalm 63? Listen to the heart of David. Listen to the heart of God. Listen to the heart of the hungry ones in Psalm 63. O God, Thou art my God. Early will I seek Thee. You are my God. Early will I seek You. You are my God. I will meet with You in the beginning of my day. You are my God. I'm going to get out of bed and seek Thee. You are my God. What makes a man or a woman get out of bed in the morning to seek God? My soul thirsteth for Thee. You ever wake up in the middle of the night thirsty? How many of you just get up and go get a drink of water when you wake up in the middle of the night and you're thirsty? Let me see your hands. Mm. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. What are you longing for, David? What's the cry of your heart? To see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Maybe you could make the prayer like this, young people. My soul longs for thee, O Lord, to see your power just like I saw your power in the Bible school. That would be a good way to say it. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name, the psalmist says. Look at verse 5. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. Walking with God in the morning, young people. Not very many people walk with God in the morning. Did you know that? Maybe you don't. Many people miss the power of this exercise because they skip the points that were already given. And they, in a religious way, drag themselves out of bed in the morning and sit down and try to read their Bible and get on their knees and try to pray, but they miss the other points that I've already mentioned. The heart's not surrendered. They have other things they're going to do. Their plans are not God's. They're their plans. The conscience isn't clear because something wasn't cleared yesterday, but yet they get up the next morning and go through the motions and open up their Bible and it doesn't go too well. Anybody ever have a time like that in the morning? You know, it's very hard to get out of bed the next morning after you've had a time like that. But I want to encourage you, don't let that quiet time slip. There are so many voices chasing after your quiet time. You've been instructed on these things. You've heard about them this week. 
This can be the most powerful part of your day, young people, if you could just imagine now with me, and I know you can, I know you've been tasting it. Where you're at here today, the heart you have right now, the joy, the strength, the clarity, how quickly you hear the Word, how quickly you respond, that's the way you're supposed to enter into your quiet time. See? See, people have that one all mixed up. You know, they kind of lose their way. They get their conscience cloudy. They're stumbling around a bit and then they think, boy, I, whew, I need some quiet time. You know, I'm really getting off here. I need to go get some quiet time. No, you need to go get on your knees and clear your heart first. <clears throat> quiet time is supposed to be lived out in the... In, in the light of that which God is doing in your hearts as you sit here right now. You're supposed to have quiet time like this. It's pretty exciting too, isn't it? I mean, that Bible is alive, isn't it? When your heart is clear, that Bible is alive. When your heart is not clear, it can be pretty dry. I mean, you know, it's the same old book and, you know, I'm not sure how many times I've read it, but it's a lot of times in 30 years. If the old heart is not clear, it can be pretty dry. But when the heart is clear, it is one powerful book. Because the Spirit of God has the freedom to minister to me where I'm at in my daily life. <clears throat> This is one of the secrets of continuous revival, young people. You know, it's kind of like um, filling the tank with gas. Amen? Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, who among us runs their car till it's absolutely out of gas, leaves you sitting on the side of the road, and you sit there for three or four days, and then finally you get out of your car and go to the gas station and get a little bit of gas and dump it in it so you can go a little further. Nobody does that. I keep my tank full. That's what God wants you to do. Amen? How many of us Wait to eat until we're absolutely starving. Huh? I mean, you know, three or four days and you think, Oh, I've got to get something to eat. How many of you eat like that? No. It's very simple, isn't it? Walking with God in the morning, young people. Do it. Change your priorities. Go home and change your priorities. Do it. Go to bed. Go to bed. So you can get up in the morning. So many people fail in the morning because they wait and go to bed late at night. Well, who can get up at 5 o'clock in the morning if you went to bed at 11 or 12? You get up and you're tired and you're dull and you didn't get enough rest and you stumble around and you try to go through something devotional and you fall asleep and listen, you're destined for failure. Get a good night's rest. Why? You got a date in the morning, amen? Hmm? You got a date in the morning. Number five. Walking with God with my parents. Say, brother, where, how, where'd you slip that one in there? <clears throat> well, most of you have parents and you're still living at home. And whether you realize it or not, whether it has dawned on you yet this week, you cannot walk with God if you do not walk with your parents. <laughs> have you figured that one out yet this week? You cannot be totally, fully surrendered to God if your heart is not surrendered to your parents. 
And I know there may be a few in 660 here who have difficult situations, and I'm not talking about you. But most of you, I'm here to tell you today, and I know that Paul already told you, but you will never learn to walk with God until you learn to walk with God with your parents. That means being under authority. That means giving up your will in a real way. Amen? I mean, you know, it's real easy to go to the altar and tell God, I give up myself and whatever I know. Lord, I yield my life to You. And then you go your own way and live your own life. But hey, when you say that to God and you go home to your mom and dad, you, know, they, you may give up your will five or six times in one morning. That's being yielded to God, young people. That's being yielded to God. God is speaking through your parents. But oh, let me tell you something. When you learn this, you will take off running in your Christian life. You will take off running in your walk with God. I've seen it. I've seen it, young people. I've seen it so many times. I've watched it. I've seen the ones who do and how they prosper. And I see the ones who don't and how they stumble along and struggle along. And and it's up and down and things don't go well. And then they get a good start again. But they're still in that heart that says, I'm not going to do what they say. All those things they want me to do. that shoe, Those shoes they want me to wear. Who do they think they are? Watch, I'm not going to be under all those laws. And who knows what you let go through your mind. You will never learn to walk with God, young people. You will never learn to walk with God. Maybe God doesn't care if you wear black shoes or brown shoes, but if your dad wants you to wear black shoes, you better wear black shoes. Amen. God is telling you to wear black shoes. You will never be able to walk with God if you do not come with a heart to your mom and dad and say, Okay, Mom. Okay, Dad. Here's my heart. You guide me. Touch my life. Come look in my closet. Come go through my music, Dad. Please. You know? You know, when people join the fellowship, they'll often stand and give their testimony. And at the end of their testimony, they'll say these words, And if you see anything in my life, please come and tell me. That would be a good thing to say to your mom and dad. Mom, dad, if you see anything in my life, please come and tell me. I want to know. You say, whoa, brother Teddy, I don't know about that. Listen, do you want to walk with God? If you want to walk with God, you're going to have to get through this one. You're going to have to get through it. And I know... There's some complicated situations in a crowd this big. I know that. But we're not going to skip the subject because of a few complicated ones. Listen, young people. You who live at home. Probably 50% of God's input into your life comes through your parents. How can you walk with God if you're not rightly related to them? Maybe you need a revival in your home life. Hmm? Number six. Walking with God in solitary. What do I mean by that? I mean, it's good for us at times to have a season alone with God. Have you ever had a season alone with God? Have you ever taken a couple of days and just spent absolutely from the beginning of the day to the end of the day alone with God? You may sit and and hear that and say, Man, what would I do (laughs) all day? I'll tell you what. One of the richest experiences of your life would be to take two days and just get alone with God. Just lock yourself up in your room and get alone with God. I practice that constantly. Charles Finney, 
that great revivalist. There's much history of revival written of what happened as an outflow of that man's ministry. Here's what he said. And he was busy in God's work. And by the way, you can lose your revival being busy in God's work. So busy doing this, doing that, going here, going there, counseling this one, talking to that one, preaching this sermon, you can lose your revival. And Finney said, when I begin to sense the anointing of God's Spirit cooling in my life, I set two days aside and fast and pray and seek God till that anointing comes back upon me again. And then I go back out into the work again. Now, mind you, he was a servant of God and he had more time than you're going to have. But all I'm saying is, if you want to have continuous revival, Sometimes you just need to take a good evaluation and say, you know, I just need some time alone. We used to have a lawn furniture business, retail, and it's very seasonal work. It's crazy busy for about four months. And in the midst of that, it can be a real challenge to... Feed your soul and all those things that we've been talking about. It was my practice every year when the lawn furniture season got over to just take a few days and set it aside and just go and get alone with my Bible and a couple of good books and a couple of good tapes and a jug of water or some juice and just lock myself away and blow out all the cobwebs. and get all that business out of there. Just dump it! And come out clear. Yes, Lord. Yeah, this is where we're going. See, you need to do that sometimes, young people. And if you don't know how to do that, you can get a tape. A season alone with God. I gave a sermon on that one time. Go through the whole day for you. What to do for this hour, and then this hour, and then this hour. I guarantee you, you do that for two days, it'll change your life. Walk with God in the solitary, young people. Have enough sense to look at your life and say, Whoa, wait a minute. Things are not what they ought to be. I'm going to go get alone for a while. Number seven. Walking in the power of the Spirit. Walking in the power of the Spirit. Let's read over in Romans. Can we do that? You know those verses in Romans chapter 8? Paul said, There is, therefore, Now, no condemnation. Praise God for that. Amen. There is therefore now no condemnation. And dear young people, if you're sitting here today and you raise your hand when I said how many of you are clear and clean and the heaven is open, I can say to you, there is therefore now no condemnation. Only the sweet, still promptings of the Spirit of God in your heart. The loving promptings of a holy God guiding your life. But, we must read a little further in this verse. Paul defines that. No condemnation to who? To them which are in Christ Jesus. And then Paul even defines what that means. Because, you know, today in America, everybody's in Christ Jesus. Right? Thank you. So he goes on to define it. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. 
There's the definition of in Christ Jesus. As you're sitting here, young people, as you raised your hand and said, I'm clean, I'm clear, heaven is open over my life. That's where you find yourself. And there is no condemnation. None. But if you walk away from this glorious freedom that God has wrought in your heart, I'm telling you, there's condemnation. You are a fool to walk down the road of your Christian life singing there's no condemnation if you are walking after the flesh. You are going to destroy yourself. Look at verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. In who? Oh, wonderful! The righteousness of the law fulfilled in us! Beautiful! But who's the us, young people? Again, Paul defines it who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. See? The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus is we walk not after the flesh, but we walk after the Spirit. If you're going to know anything at all about continuous revival, you must learn to walk after the promptings of the Spirit in your life. God's Spirit will lead you. God's Spirit will reprove you. God's Spirit will bless you. God's Spirit will teach you. But you must learn to obey those promptings. <clears throat> and so many people, they have such a hard time obeying the promptings of the Spirit because they're so used to following the promptings of their flesh, they hardly know when the other is around. But again... Ah, I have you. You do know what it is now, don't you? You know what it is for the Spirit of God to prompt you. Very well. Walk in that. Jesus said to His disciples in Luke chapter 11, some beautiful words about the Spirit of God. He said to the disciples who said, Lord, teach us how to pray. <clears throat> In his lessons, he said, If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Someone asked yesterday, uh, not someone, a few asked yesterday, you know, about the power of the Holy Spirit, and, you know, how do you know if you have the Holy Spirit? And all these were lots of questions that came. Well, let me just give you a very simple explanation. You're right with God today. You're right with your Father in heaven. Your heart is yielded to Him. You're clear. All you need to do is ask. Father, give me the Holy Spirit. I need Your Spirit, Lord. Thank You. I receive it. Thank You, Father. I receive it by faith. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now walk in it. Just walk in it. I am constantly asking God to fill me with the Spirit. I don't just go to the beginning of the day and say, Okay, God, give me your Spirit. I need it today. No, I'm constantly seeking God for more grace in my life. Right? Even though you walk in the Spirit. Come to a place here, you're behind the pulpit. You've been walking with God through the day, but now you're behind the pulpit. Lord, I can't do this. Give me Your Spirit. You promised. You promised You would. And I believe You will. Fill me with Your Spirit, Lord. 
and thank you. Amen. And go on with God. Young people, let me give you a real simple secret. If your heart is clear, just ask Him and believe. He promised. You say, well, how do I know and will I feel something? And you know, all the... sometimes you do. Sometimes you don't. Don't go by your feelings. Walk by faith. But listen to this verse, young people. When Paul said in Ephesians 5.18, Be filled with the Spirit. You know the verse? Be filled with the Spirit. Here's what that verse means. If you break it down in the Greek, it means this. Be being continually filled and controlled by the Spirit of the living God. That's what it means. Be being continually filled. It's a present continuous word in the Greek. Again and again and again and again and again and again and again. You know, just, just walk with me through a Bible school day. You know, I get up in the morning. I've got a sermon to prepare. I get alone with God. I need His Spirit in order to prepare that sermon. And I begin at the beginning of the day to say, God, please give me Your Spirit this morning. I love You, Lord. I want to walk with You today. Fill me with Your Spirit this morning, God. And, and I pray some, and I sing some, and I, I read some, and then I sit down to start writing. And as I sit down to write, I say, Lord, fill me with Your Spirit. I need to know what to say to the young people today. And how shall I say it, Lord? And, while I, and then I'll get up and walk around the bit, and, and I'll say that again, Lord. I need Your grace. Give me Your grace in my life, God. Just continue. Continue to give me your grace and I'll sit back down and I'll start writing again. And I start praying that way again. I walk through the door and I start meeting people. And people come up to me and start asking me questions. God, give me the wisdom. God, give me the wisdom. Give me your spirit so I'll know what to say when they give me this question and give me that one. And I get up here to preach and it's God. I need your spirit. Give me your spirit again, Lord. Be being continually filled with and controlled by the Holy Spirit, young people. If you want continual revival, you will have to come to grips with that. And There's no way that I can teach you all that needs to be said about that subject in this little short point. But I would encourage you, there's a tape set on the Holy Spirit. You can get that. Where I spend five hours doing nothing but going through this subject. Number eight, and lastly, and we'll be done here. Walking with God by faith. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 5, we walk by faith and not by sight. I want to remind you of that, young people. We walk by faith and not by sight. We, he could have also said we walk by faith and not by feelings. Amen? Amen? Many times, young people, they get a little bit mixed up in that thing, you know, and feelings... Uh, take the forefront and, you know, they've got to have the feelings or they're not sure where they're at with God and many times they, they, they doubt whether they've been converted because they don't have the feelings. Well, I had feelings last night, but I don't have them today, so I'm not sure if it took. And, you know, it's not by feelings, young people. It's by faith. Now, many times there are feelings, but sometimes there are no feelings. Amen? Sometimes when it's time for me to preach, I'm sitting there and my heart is burning. I mean, I'm full of feelings. But sometimes I'm sitting there and I don't have any feelings. Shall I say I'm not going to get up there if I don't have any feelings? No. I'm walking by faith. I just get up there. Guess what? Everything comes out all right. Why? Because I'm walking by faith. I'm trusting God. I'm trusting God for the grace to live today. See? Believing that He's going to meet me in whatever I need. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says it this way. I want to read it. I think I can quote it, but I don't want to have to go to it. 
Listen to these words, Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Whoa. Did you get that? And here we are, we're doing this and doing this and doing this and doing and doing and doing and doing. But young people, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Faith is one of the major laws of God's economy. Now, faith produces works. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Why? For he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Young people, I want to testify to you today, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. But, God doesn't always reward you five minutes after you get on your knees. (laughs) Amen, Brother John? He doesn't. But He is a rewarder. I'm here to tell you, He is such a rewarder. He is a rewarder, not of those who get on their knees for five minutes, but a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him, believing that He is and that He will reward me. And all the rewards are so many, it would take a whole sermon to describe them, young people. But I just want to finish with those words. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. If you will set the sails of your life while you are young to seek God continually, don't turn back and don't let up. And don't allow the fire to go out in your soul, but maintain that confidence and that rejoicing steadfast to the end. You will look back over your life and say, as I am saying, God has so richly rewarded me, I can't begin to explain it. So, beloved young people, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He endured His cross. Let us also endure ours and know what it is to live in continuous revival. Let's pray. Lord God, we bless You and we thank You for Your goodness to us, God. You have not slacked concerning any of Your promises. Father, I just want to commit these young people to You. Lord, You know what they could do. Oh Lord, if they would grasp these things, And live them out over the next year, God. I commit them into your care. Thank you for each one of them. Thank you for their willing hearts, their hungry hearts, their desires. Oh God, give them the spiritual desires of their hearts, Lord. The spiritual desires, Father. I just commit them into your care now, God. Keep them away from extremes.